Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm really honoured. I flew in from Dubai this morning, um, so I'm a wee bit jet lagged, but I'm going to do my best. Um, so my background is design education, and my mother started a design school in Australia 28 years ago. And I was literally brought up in this environment and carried down the catwalk and then was thrown into the most unglamorous version of what fa fashion really is. Um, and so my journey has taken me into really weird and wonderful places. Um, but how on earth is it related to retail? Um, and I think the bigger question is how on earth do you sell wearable technology? Um, we sit in the gap between consumer electronics and fashion. And I think in the gap is like an amazing opportunity, but some people see it as a little bit threatening. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Uh, so we believe in designing for humans in a digital age. Um, and that really means you've got to think about this hardware, this software and apparel as this all-encompassing idea. Um, and in doing so, we have to think about all five senses. And I'm really going to explore how we design retail in that sense. How do we design retail for the senses? Um, so my career, and I forgot my buzzer, I'm so sorry, there we go. Um, my career really began with more of a risque product. Um, I was brought onto a project called Funderwear, and Funderwear is vibrating knickers for couples in long distance relationships. <laughs> yes, extremely bizarre. I have once upon a time met Hugh Hefner um, and presented this product to him, so it was wild. Um, so because of this, I went on this journey. We had 8 million hits on YouTube, 55,000 requests for the product, and 1,600 articles written in two weeks. So yes, we know that sex sells, but there was obviously something else behind this that we were on to. Um, so following that, we started looking at how on earth do we sell it? Um, and what, what and why made this so successful? Uh, so in my opinion, it was because it was technology, but it didn't look like technology. Um, so I'm in this conundrum, right? I want to be a tech company, but I don't want to look anything like a tech company. And so my life of contradictions began. Um, I then went down this path of believing that we don't have to live in a digital world that is all dominated by screens. Um, I don't think this is part of our future. But how on earth do you sell something to someone if screens aren't involved? Um, and it's part of the problem that I sit in every day. So following this, we went down a, a journey to New York. I moved to New York two years ago. Um, and I had this very, very first world problem where I first arrived and I had no idea where I was going. So I was constantly looking down at my smartphone. Um, and while looking down at the phone, I would almost run into taxis and fall off sidewalks and run into other people. And I was totally dictated by this phone and I wasn't looking up at all. Uh, so we designed a jacket. And the jacket is the urban wayfinding jacket for the retail explorer. Uh, so for indoor and outdoor navigation, you can upload from your smartphone where you'd like to travel to, and then either using sensors inside the space or natural Google Maps. You can then be directed around the space or outside by a tap on the shoulder, when to turn left, when to turn right, and then double time when you arrive. Um, I started thinking about, okay, if we have to design for humans in this digital age, what does it mean to truly be human? Um, and there's some wonderful cliches around this space. It means intimacy, it means empathy, it means self-awareness. And how do I design for those emotional aspects? Um, so I'm going to show you a quick video. So we, at that point, thought, could the jacket be used for Tinder? Can you use this to find other people that you want to meet or see or interact with? Could it be used for an event? Um, so this time last year, I released the Paris Navigate, of which I'm wearing, um, at Paris Fashion Week. While I was wandering around the city in the exact same context, couldn't find my way around, I was using the jacket to navigate me. Um, I then came a few, uh, across a few other problems. How do you charge it? How do you make it washable and durable? And of course, we had to solve those problems. Uh, so our electronics are removable and rechargeable. And we then invented a coat hanger that has induction charge. So instead of having to plug in another device at the end of the day, you just naturally hang this up when you're finished and it charges itself. 
This coat hanger, I actually think, needs ultra, ultra disruption. It's the most ancient device and it's so irritating. In every retail store we have a coat hanger and I absolutely hate them. If someone can reinvent this, I will be so, so grateful. So what does the future of connected clothing really look like um, and how do you sell it? More interestingly, how do you sell any technology that is invisible? I believe it has to be emotional and has to be soft, not only on the body, but also in the way we communicate it. I don't want bright flashing lights to be the tool of how you sell wearable tech for the rest of time. So I've thought about women being 70% of all consumers ever, how to make emotional products for them and how to make them soft. So going on from that, we have started to build a retail environment. Um, and I want to share some of my learnings with you about this retail environment. Um, we tested a product called the Fan Jersey that we built for the Netherlands rugby team. It was Rugby Sevens team. Um, and we wanted to see how these emotional aspects really play out in a physical display. Uh, so we quantified impact, heartbeat, adrenaline, excitement and exhaustion during the game. And then we let them replay that game and feel it while they're watching it. Um, we've learnt so many things. Um, first of all, men want the impact to always be harder and they also want it to just go all the time. They literally want to feel every impact in the game. Women love this product because they feel like they know more about the sport than they ever have before, and children are obsessed with vibration. Um, I didn't really know this was a thing, but apparently it's connected to the way the mother speaks to them in the womb, and that is a vibration, and so they love it as a young person. Um, not only that, but also questions like, what questions do they ask in this space? Um, how long does it take them to touch the product? How likely are they to try it on? I have between one and four minutes to get them to touch this product. How do I push them into that space? How do I design for all five senses inside that space? So these are some of my learnings, is that you can't put tech before the human experience. You have to design for the human experience first, always. Those, those are those things, empathy, self-awareness, subconsciousness. Um, how do we design for exploration? How do we design for intimacy? And how do you design a space that has all of those things inside it? This isn't just about a space, it's also about online. Uh, it also needs to be about all five senses online. Um, so for the first time ever, I'm actually looking into videos that give you haptic feedback, so that while you're watching the video, you can feel what this product might, event might eventually do for you down the line. So how do you design for smell? How do you design, design for taste? How do you design for sound? Directional sound, I think, is one of the things that's going to be really interesting inside retail. And then how do you design for movement? Not just of a fabric or a body, um, but movement of industries. I see this future being something where we're 3D printing our own garments, but we're 3D printing it with intelligence. So we're, let's say, printing in a mushroom fiber, and then we're literally just upgrading our clothing with software. That's the future of it. So where, where, is, where is retail inside that space? Where is the opportunity? And then how do you design for touch in this digital age? Touch is really, really intimate. We have to think about how to touch people in really interesting and new ways. For me, retail has to be about discovery. I think that so often we forget that people actually do want to discover this for themselves. Um, they are complex beings. We do have emotional states. Um, but you've also got to be able to take the piss out of yourself. And if you can't do that, people get really bored really fast. And that, to me, was why Fonderwear was so successful. So in finishing, I just wanted to say thank you again. Um, I've obviously learned a lot through this journey so far. We've been around for three years. Um, and if there's anything I can leave you with, it's that retail really is about connecting two far-fetched ideas to create something new um, and leaving them with that sense of discovery. Thanks. Don't go, don't go, Ooh, don't, don't go, go, don't go. I need to get knowledge yes, out of you. Of course. I saw you like just, frantically just, scribbling. Just, you can't leave back to Dubai until we've got no, some no. information. Um, which retailers do you see as getting the opportunity? Mm. Yeah, good question. Okay, I, I think Colette's really trying. That's in Paris. In Paris, yes. Um, mostly because as you walk in, you have consumer electronics next to fashion. And so they're bridging that gap already. Um, although there's another floor with the more high-end version, I think that they understand that you've got to play between, between these spaces. Um, I don't think it's just about sort of a new digital screen, another touch application. I really think it's about playing with people and, and making them feel a little bit uncomfortable. Um, so the, the retailers that are sort of making it about the experience, making it like a museum, uh, making it like a theme park, 
they're, they're some of the most interesting ones for me. And what about the fashion brands themselves, the manufacturers? Mm -hmm. Who is advanced in terms of integrating the tech with the fabric? Yeah, I mean, there's more than I actually thought, which is exciting for me because I looked for these guys for three years. Um, I've seen some really great manufacturers out of Sri Lanka. Um, I'm sure you know who Flextronics are. Um, they're sort of the monster behind every wearable tech product. And they are connected with a lot of retailers and not, not just retailers, manufacturers as well. So there are brands like Ralph Lauren that have been experimenting. They partnered with OnSignal, I mm -hmm. think, to put sensors inside T-shirts and things. Yeah. Is this a novelty or is this something that we're going to see more mainstream brands doing? I think if you're only about the data, people will get a little bit bored. If you make the data sexy and about this human experience rather than just quantified self, um, I can't wait for that term just to disappear, um, then I think you're able to actually sell it forever. Um, but we're yet to really see people target women in this space properly. Um, and I think that's part of the missing link as well. So lastly, um, there's people in the audience who have big mainstream customer databases. They have lots of physical retail space or at least screen space that leads to people spending <laughs> money. Um, apart from connected underwear, um, what should they go back to the office tomorrow and start planning? Well, I think it depends on who the consumer is first. I, like, I always I think that I start like an anthropologist, study them and then say, okay, here are the problems I have to solve. Um, but if something like travel is at the core of your brand, then something like the navigational product would work. If something like weather is the core of your brand, you have to think a little bit differently. Maybe it's a graphene temperature sensor, um, and maybe you're applying it in the most weird and wonderful way so that someone knows more about themselves than ever before. Great. Thank you very much, Billy, of Wearable Experiments. Thank you.